You just pressed play on the Last Breath Hunt Cast, home of the Hunterversy. We're here to entertain, educate, and engage. And in case you didn't know, you only live once. But if you do it right, once is enough. Don't waste it. Welcome, everybody, to the Last Breath Hunt Cast. This is Garrett. Across from me is Grant. Hello. We're happy to have you here, and we are just days away from November. This is episode number 165, and we're proudly presented to you by Badlands. Badlands is the title sponsor of our podcast, and if you want to save 30% off of some hunting gear this season, specifically packs or maybe some base layers, that new Celine's jacket and pants, man, they are really nice. It's the perfect outfit for November, the right amount of warmth, dead whisper quiet, um, and it's it's really fit in the gap that they didn't have, but we have a code for you. That is last breath 22 bl 30 all caps, all together. You enter that at the checkout under the coupon code, and you will save 30% off on your Badlands order. Thank you for taking advantage of that, by the way. That helps us out, and uh, we believe that that discount's pretty substantial, which is why we fight for high ones every year uh, for this podcast, and we appreciate you guys using that code. So we hope that you can get some gear and use it, hopefully within a couple days if you have not already shot a buck. So this episode, what are we talking about? So we're kind of be talking about... I guess multiple things. Yeah, huh? uh, it's it's a controversy slash bullshit session between our opinions on uh october myths and kind of misconceptions so we're going to talk about what our beliefs are on the october lull and we're going to talk about body sizes and aging deer uh specifically aging bucks this time of year but um before we do that we also want to thank tompkins taxidermy those guys are absolutely killing it um they're almost finished up with all of the deer that they had from last year so everybody will have their deer well before one year turnaround they've got some other really cool projects to work on they have a full-size grizzly bear Whoa. that they're mounting uh and that thing it's it's pretty impressive to see one you know we don't when are we going to have the opportunity to see one that close Probably you can go not. to the zoo maybe never you know maybe and maybe they have one but you're looking at it from 30 feet away but uh i was over there the other day and it's it's pretty impressive they also have some African game that they're working on. They had Jeez. elk, a fallow deer. It's it's pretty neat to see how you know much diversity is in the shop. Yeah, but not just whitetails. Not just, that's their bread and butter. Don't get me wrong, man. Those guys, those guys know whitetail like nobody's business. But anyway, if you shoot a buck this year and you want some fantastic quality taxidermy, we've got an exclusive code that makes sure you're going to get that back by midsummer next year. Um, you know, we, we haven't quite figured out the details on the launch party, but with that being said, regardless, if you use the code last breath, simple as that, uh, there's only 20 slots, but you will actually get that expedited to the front of the line and you will make sure to have your deer back by the middle of July of next year. So that's pretty, pretty dang nice. You know, let's say you shoot your deer during gun season here and boom, you get it back in the middle of July. That's pretty impressive turnaround. Absolutely. Um, I feel like this is a really, really good controversy here, and I feel like there's a lot of varying opinions on it, which is what makes it so controversial in the first place. So our question first um, for you, and then I'll go, and we can just kind of go back and forth on this one. The October lull, do you believe it exists, yes or no? No, I, I, I absolutely hate this term. I hate this term more than a, a lot of things in the hunting world. Um, just because, I mean, if you go back and look through all your trail cameras and you look at, at, you know, the, the fan pages or harvest pages, people kill deer from opening day to the last day of season bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I will admit there are peaks and there are better times for deer activity. I'm not dismissing that, but mm -hmm. when people say the October lull, they, they pretty much say, well, we're in the lull and they just, they just write it off as like this week or weekend or whatever is just totally crap. No reason to hunt. It's just, it's, it's just kaput. It's the time of the year where mm -hmm. deer just go in their caves. And uh, I just don't think that's true. I have a, a lot of strong opinions about why people feel they encounter an October lull and we're going to get into that. But mm -hmm. as, as an overall answer, I just, I don't believe in it. I don't like it and we'll get into why, but what are your thoughts? 
Yeah, I I feel like as we continue to encounter deer in October, which we're going to get into like that, and like a small recap of our season this far, kind of debunking this misnomer that uh, deer just shut down from the, I don't know, the 7th through the 20th. I I just think, to me, like you said, deer becoming um, nocturnal, not based upon like the October lull, like if the word lull in and of itself, like when you just look at the term, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means like a pause or a decline of something, which would imply that it was great. And then we're now in this valley of, you know, sadness, right. depression, right. slow hunting. And, and that's not the case because I feel like, uh, again, to have a lull, like arguably i would i would say the december lull you know like we're coming off a of steaming smoking white hot After november like season. oh man it's the december lull like everything's cooling down now well yeah most of the deer are done breeding and they've been shot and messed around with and pushed and bumped and x y and z so i feel like it'd almost be better apt to call it the december lull than the october lull because I feel like what we're going to get into today is something that you and I have both noticed and we've encountered, I don't know, I mean, just looking at this season, for example, on the bread and butter farm, we could have already shot two four-year-olds. We're managing for five, but opening night, we had a ni- chance to shoot a really, a pretty nice nine-pointer. Um, you know, one of the deer we know that was three last year out there, and then the deer that you passed twice already. Um, I can't remember what you named him. But John Henry. John Henry. I mean, lots of lots of people. We posted this photo you did on the uh, Instagram page the other day, and lots of people believe that this deer was older, which um, we're going to get into that further down the line on the podcast. But long story short, I believe to have a lull, it's got to be good, then go to crap, then go back to good, like the, the a parabola, right? but I don't feel like there is a lull because I feel like the lull is a, a fictitious thing that's more or less man-made. Well, especially this year, it's a perfect culprit to prove that that's not true. Mm-hmm. You hit it on the head with that date range, like the 7th through the 20th, and this year was an anomaly in the Midwest. Last week was probably some of the best weather we've mm-hmm. had in October yep. in a long time. Yep. And on Wednesday, which would have been right smack dab, and traditionally most people's lull yep. is when I passed John Henry, and yep. I saw another really nice deer that night, you know? Yep. so. I think we that we saw a nice one opening day, and we saw another nice one on the like tenth time frame. Yeah. You know, all four year olds, all deer that are you know awesome caliber, big thick deer. We're just trying to kill that five year old on this particular farm. So, I feel like for the last eight years that we've been tippy toeing around October, we've had an encounter with a four or five year old buck in October, uh, several three year olds as well. And I just think that the October lull is a man-made thing. And you can go ahead and get a, get on to why you think it is man-made. Because oh, yeah. I think it's just totally <laughs> a way to write off a Mistakes. lack of patience. Mistakes. More I, than so, anything. Yeah, I mean, and this isn't to be condescending. I'm not above any man, woman, child, anything. Especially not above any hunter. And we like uh, hunting as well. We love it, dude. And I just think that when you hear people talk about the October lull... Or, or like a slow up in their cameras, or they're just not seeing deer. This is why I think that is. I think it's cultivated and self-inflicted. So a lot of people get really excited for the opener, and we do too. And actually this year, mm-hmm. surprisingly, we decided to hunt on the opening weekend. It did fall on a Saturday, which was very convenient. But traditionally, the like, wind was perfect. The wind was the... perfect. And we had a deer that was daylighting. Like there was re- no reason not to hunt. And we saw three bucks, two three year olds, and a four year old that walked right we through saw our way shooting. more than three bucks. Uh, that, three, I... three bucks of that age. Yeah. And then a lot of other like subordinate ones. It was ones. fantastic. Huh? Yeah, it was a great hunt. Um, but, but, anywho, I'm, what I'm getting at is that traditionally in years past, let's, let's look at last year. Me and you didn't physically hunt until the 17th of October. Yep. I mean, which was three days after tj daylighted so we went in there tried to get him didn't we waited another five six days tried to go in there again on after a pattern Mm -hmm. um didn't and on our third time going after him on a pattern we saw him we encounter him and should have killed him (laughs) should have killed him but mother nature had other plans but what i'm getting at is not necessarily i'm just saying we've been very patient and uh I'm really excited because when we launch that episode, you guys will kind of watch how we've evolved and grown mm-hmm. as hunters. Not We don't hunt 
opening weekend and we don't hunt every weekend because we don't love hunting. There's no lack or lust, uh, you know, lack of lust of hunting or drive. It's, it's actually the quite inverse. We know that by being patient, we're going to be better off. And so mm-hmm. getting back to the October lull, I feel like we have a lot of people who are super excited about October and, or the opener. And don't get me wrong. You wait nine it. months. Yeah. You've been waiting for mm-hmm. a long time to get back out there. But what happens is, is you get kind of antsy and then you go and you hunt. And that first time you're kind of knocking the, the dust off, right? Maybe you forget something. Maybe you're a little noisier than you thought you would be. And, you know, every time you go out there, whether you bump a deer or not, you're leaving ground scent. And every time when you go out there, um, whether you intentionally do it or not, most times not intentionally, you're adding a, a, a dose of pressure to that farm. Mm-hmm. You know, you're walking in and out and you're climbing in the sand. You're you're there when you weren't and you haven't been for eight months. So these deer that you love to hunt, you know, they've been left alone for six, seven, eight, nine months. And now all of a sudden you have pressure and then repeat pressure because you want to go out again and have that, you know, get the itch done. You want to kill a doe and then you kill a doe and now you have that disturbance. And then you go into week two and maybe the wind's not quite favorable, but you got some pictures of some bucks that are really exciting and you go in anyway. Mm -hmm. And what happens is these first two weeks that you hunt and they're the easiest to hunt after work as well, because you have the lack of time change. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the sunsets even later, you know, all of a sudden Mm -hmm. this, this farm or this place or this lease, that had no human pressure, you know, other than maybe you running cameras and some other things, all of a sudden gets this flood. And that's where I think the October lull comes from. You know, you got to think, well, now you're checking your cameras a little more often because well, it matters now. It's season, right? Yeah. yeah. And you're moving some stuff around. Maybe you're trying some new, some new scent and scrapes, you know, that you, you think is going to be the concoction. And it could be. But, you know, again, you're throwing something out there that these deer are like, whoa, maybe they're like, what is this stuff? You know what yeah. I mean? And all of a sudden, like I said, that farm that you, that was great, that you think you had all these deer on, it slows down and they didn't mm-hmm. run away. They just, you maybe pressured them into being nocturnal or maybe that mature, because a mature deer especially is not going to put up with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we have some close friends that are really, I mean, they check their cameras almost daily, you know, weekly for sure. And, uh. I mean, they go out, they try all kinds of scents and stuff. I mean, we, we know who I'm talking about. And like, you know, right now they're like, we just don't have any pictures of these mature deer on our farms. And it's kind of like, well, is this a self-inflicted wound? You know, I know that you've hunted out there and you took a youth out there and now you're trying a whole bunch of other things. And like, well, is this, is this, you know, did you shoot yourself in the foot, so to speak, you know? And again, like I said, being as careful as you can be, you're always going to have some degree, whether it's, uh, uh, singular, you know, let's say it's a, a, like using one through 10 scale, like it's only a one out of 10, but if you do a one out of 10, five times now it's a five, you know, mm-hmm. and then you go in and you make a big disturbance, like you shoot a doe and that's a five. Now you're at a 10, you know, and that scale just keeps growing. That's my opinion. I just feel like <clears throat> that's my thought process. I've seen oh, YouTube's fantastic. And like, if you watch Bill Winky, he's really smart and like a lot of times in a lot of years he doesn't hunt unless he has a reason to Mm -hmm. and when he goes in it's almost like the first time hanging or hunting in the stand or it's first time hunting in this food plot it's a lot of first and you'll listen to that and you'll you'll start to 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 catch those that Mm -hmm. that the saying first time and then the episode sometimes or more times than not especially if it's up there ends with them killing a deer yep and there's a commonality there that those guys are really they're not they they love hunting just as much as we do more right shoot bill winky's created in his entire career and life around it yep. same thing with lee lakoski and the heartland bow hunter guys like mm-hmm. there's just a commonality there where they're hunting strategically yep. and i think that which pr- is easier said that oh my said god than done because yeah. i do feel like to, to back up the guy that's you know working a day job like myself um i do feel that <laughs> There, there is a, a line, like, especially, you know, now I feel like, um, especially if you're a landowner, you know, you want to go down there and take advantage of this property or this lease or what have you. And you've been waiting for so long and you're, you're saying to yourself, all right, well, I do have a deer daylighting, but to be honest, if we didn't have the deer that we want to shoot, who's Megatron daylight three consecutive days prior to the first we would not have went hunting. No. We wouldn't have went hunting. That we, was the reason that we went hunting is to kill that deer. We wouldn't have been hunting at all. Yeah. Like we've <clears throat> we've went hunting this year so far in October because we 
we went in to kill a deer. Yep, and that we deer. Thought we could, like it wasn't. It wasn't like oh, it's a nice night. I'm gonna go hunting, mm-hmm. which I'm not. I don't want you. I want you to think that like you can't yep. hunt. We're not the deer hunting police. You can do whatever you, you can do want. whatever the hell you want. We're just talking about. I think that the October lull and the myth that's around it is sometimes, and I should say more times than not, encompassed around that. I think there's other indicators that would cause the October lull. Mm-hmm. The weekend that we're recording this podcast on, it's 80 degrees. Yep. That's going to cause and October a is super temperate, you know, like right now we, the low in Illinois, like there's been a couple nights where it's been below freezing, uh, last week, the week before it's been like upper twenties. And I mean, shoot today, which is the 23rd, 22nd, 23rd is it's going to be a high of 82. I mean, that's an extremely high temperature swing. And so I feel like uh, the weather is a culprit as well in kind of bumping and buffing up this October lull type myth. But to me, that's, you know, a warm front isn't necessarily a, you know, that's, oh, that's that can happen anytime. Yeah. You know, like, like you said earlier, was well, there a December lull? Is there a November lull? Is there a January lull? Like, you know, <laughs> traditionally going into yeah. the, the I just mid-20s. don't know why for my life, for, for the life of me, I've never understood the phrase October lull, which is why in every video that we put out and every podcast we put out, in fact, if you go and listen to episode 164, which is how to hunt the October lull, I have it in air quotes because I just don't feel like, I don't feel like it's a thing. Like, are you telling me that on the 1st of October, the hunting is so incredibly white hot that now on the 10th, it's trash? Like deer are going into hiding? What's the reason for that? You would believe as the photo period gets shorter, which triggers the rut, as the days wind on and bucks get more filled with testosterone, that it would only become better, Mm -hmm. which is truly why I believe that this is a a myth. Man, so you said Mm -hmm. photo triggered, which you 100% hit. I'm going to go on a tangent here and talk about another myth. I mean, we have... I've, I've had multiple guys say, hey, I think the rut's early this year. And it's the cold weather last week and the week before. Like you said, it was in the 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, frost. We did hear, and some areas we've heard some was, rutting-esque behavior like a buck. You yes. know, we heard that buck roar about, I don't know, six days ago when we were hunting. That was a really cool encounter. Again, a night we could have shot a, a real nice four-year-old. But is but, that would you call that rutting? Like he no, grunted loudly. No. He didn't chase the doe. He didn't no. dog the doe. There was no fighting you know Mm -hmm. i just sometimes i wonder like a three-year-old's gonna be a three-year-old it's kind of like a teenager being a teenager they're wild they're rowdy they're gonna be loud and obnoxious you know like Mm -hmm. i just some bucks are more personality driven than others you know some bucks are more vocal some bucks are more i'm just saying so the, the rut the rut is caused by does coming into estrus that's what like the peak rut the 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 tip of the pin is when does are being bred. Mm -hmm. And so what causes a doe to come into estrus is photoreceptors cause chemicals to release, hormones to release. It's not cold. A lot of guys, I think this cold snap got a doe to pop. Temperature has nothing to do with it. It actually has Mm -hmm. to do with the amount of daylight that they get. And Mm -hmm. like for the same reason that we, you know, I could look it up on my phone and tell you what the sunrise is going to be on December 7th of 2024. Mm Mm-hmm is the same reason why you can really predict when that's mm-hmm. going to happen. Now, mm-hmm. not every doe is programmed the same. It's not like, oh, they get uh, X amount of darkness a day and they hit it. It's not a simple equation. Mm-hmm. There's factors that come into that, mm-hmm. which is why different farms have different times of rutting, which we've seen. Yeah. But it's kind of like how humans have different tolerances of like seafood allergies or whatever, right? You know, mm-hmm. um, but... That's it, plain and simple. Like a doe will come into estrus due to the amount of darkness perceived. Same reason why bucks add testosterone and why they shed their antlers. Like Mm -hmm. there are other factors that can that can cause it to happen quicker. Like if a buck is super stressed, yes, he'll shed earlier. Mm -hmm. But like within a within a very pretty tight bracket, very predictable window. It's a very predictable window. So like that's another myth that I just. The rut happens when the rut happens, like, yep. and it's, it's their science. It's crazy cool science behind it. And we don't like hunting during the peak rut. I hate the, the oh. peak rut is my Lockdown. least favorite time to hunt. In fact, I, I like the seeking and f- chasing phase. Like, I feel like truly, if you can lock yourself to a tree between the 1st of November 
through the 13th of November. And if you dial that down even more, the 3rd through the 11th, <laughs> I feel like your chances of s- killing your target buck during the rut are going to go way up. Or maybe a roaming buck are going to go way up. And that's, I feel like, truly, of all the people that I know that you know take a week or so, that's that's normally when they're tagging out. That's normally when they're killing bucks. Um, and I feel like... <laughs> It, it's year after year after year. And if you look at the Illinois harvest reporting data for, for bow hunting, yeah, you'll notice the same thing. Like ding, the, ding, pe- ding. the peak every single year uh, is like one day plus or minus the eighth. One Our peak bow hunting harvest day for bucks in Illinois is either the seventh, the eighth, or the ninth every single year like clockwork. Um, That's if crazy. If you don't believe me, then go check. <laughs> and so <laughs> speaking of that, there's a good little point to inject. <clears throat> the next episode that we're doing after this is actually going to be the Illinois hunting statistics for 2021. We did this last year. Grant actually looked it all up, and it was pretty insightful. We had a lot of guys like, oh, wow, no kidding. So um, I'm most interested to see how much more the crossbow percentage has climbed for I archery I think we're kills. probably going to be over the 50-50 I mark. Think so I think too. we're sitting at 51-49 in 2020, and I think uh, last year it's probably going to be the first year in Illinois history that uh, crossbows are going to be more used to kill deer than compound compound vertical bows that's the next one so anything else you want to talk about like with the october lull miss like i've i've clearly want to say that weather does affect movement but the wet to me when people talk about the october lull it is a bracketed time like you said it is a date you Mm -hmm. know because i would say for most most people the october lull would have fell like last week Mm -hmm. because traditionally for us especially like the mid to late 20s of october well, that's we're one like, of my favorite times to hunt <laughs> scraping baby like yeah. we got mm-hmm. a deer that's on a pattern we're waiting for the weather to mm-hmm. break to make him daylight you know yeah where i would say now if you asked uh you know a random hundred people like hey when do you think the october low is going to be this year they say well, this weekend the 20th. no they'd like say this weekend of... it's warm it's oh yeah 82 yeah, yeah. degrees like it's mm-hmm. shit this is the october low like well that's a weather pattern like you can't mm-hmm. Every time it warms up, it's probably not going to help, right? You know, before December. But. Yeah, and I feel like weather does have a good indicator on like buck movement. Like I feel like the rut two years ago, when it was unseasonably warm and it was like seventy or eighty degrees every day. I mean, shoot, we even had a day where it was like pushing ninety. Um, that it was miserable, and that was the year that you and I we tagged out. We killed three bucks that year uh, during the rut, but it was all within like the first 90 minutes of daylight. And we were like, yeah, it's nine o'clock. You ready to get down? Yeah. It's, it's, it's 84. It's hot as shit. Um, and then we go and we get in our tree stand at four and hunt, you know, for the last 20 minutes of light and prepare ourselves for that. So Mm -hmm. I feel like, I feel like weather does slow down movement during the rut. Like if you can get that cool, crisp high of like 52 day bow hunters dream, it's twenties in the morning when you wake, walk in and it's 40, 50 all day. That's sweet, but I feel like weather can, you know, weather can trump the time of year to a degree or slow it down or accelerate it. I think that time of year trumps weather, honestly, like, but I think weather can affect it. I think weather can slow it. Oh, absolutely. It can, what I was getting, it can enhance it or it can hurt it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the October lull though, I think, like I said, I just, I guess maybe I'm having trouble with the word. Uh, for me, that's my hang up because I just don't feel like the first versus the tenth. There's an astronomical plummet in deer activity, movement, etc. I guess I feel like it's I feel like it's due to humans. And I mean, if you look at like even the deer that we're targeting at the bread and butter farm, Megatron, right? I mean, for the first three day for the three days prior to season, he daylighted every day in right in our lap. Mm-hmm. I don't. He had not daylighted that aggressively that quickly for the three weeks prior. I have a hunch that possibly what happened is the neighbors next door to us hanging up stands in preparation, maybe a little too late. Cameras. Cameras. Everybody everything checks cameras like before the first, especially that, with this weekend. That It'll be on I the weekend. don't find it coincidental that, you know, there's 10 to 15 people hunting over there. And if everybody goes and hangs up a camera and a stand, that's 30 different data points on that property. It's 30 really quickly. Yep. Um, and I feel like that's one of the reasons that he was pushed over to our side of the fence so rapidly, so quickly this year into well, daylight. And, you know, 
again, to go right on that, not even daylight, just the amount of photo uptick we got of him. It's It, it was like literally a light, light switch. switch. Once the opener came, it was consistent. Like, Every day. Because we were going, we were getting him here and there because yep. his home range was kind of mm-hmm. caught between us. And then, yep. then all of a sudden it's like, well, there's a, a, there's a change. Yeah, and there's it, a big change. Big change. And, you know, I, I don't know. I guess in a nutshell, if you believe in the October lull and you're, you think you're riding it right now, just ask yourself this question. How many times have I hunted? You know, I think if, you know, if you're a guy that's like, oh, I think there's an October lull and you haven't hunted yet, eh, then, okay, let's talk. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. But if you're a guy that's like, man, this this October, it's been, you know, just it's just started to shut down. Well, let's let's look at what you've done mm-hmm. since season opened, you know. How many times have you hunted? How many times have you checked cameras? How many times have you put out scrape? You know, and like, I do this stuff too. Yeah. I don't want to be caught saying I'm a hypocrite. I, I 100% install scrapes and check cameras and do all this stuff. But you just kind of have to be a little bit more mindful about it, especially Mm -hmm. if you're trying to hunt and do this stuff, you know, because in, in years in the past, like typically we don't hunt until now. I feel like perspective is really, really important. And I always feel like one of the things that I find interesting in life is like, why does a person psychologically think the way they think what happened in their life to make them think that way. And I feel like looking through another person's lens is like critically important. So our lens right now and like what we're talking about, if you roll back a layer is we want to kill the biggest buck we can in October. That's why we're not hunting a ton in October unless data suggests that we hunt in October, which is the days that we've went and we've seen a four year old on every hunt. But I do feel like the important lens is if you're a guy that's sitting listening to this right now and you're saying, oh, I want to go kill a doe, that's fine. There are different end goals and different end games. If you're a person that's going to take out a youth hunter to get their first deer, that's okay. We're not saying that. That's the lens that we're operating through. When we're talking about October a little, we're not saying that our doe populations and our doe herds have hit, taken a hit on uptick. We're specifically targeting, you know, on this farm this year, it's one buck. We believe we have one five-year-old and that's the, the one we're heavily monitoring. All the other deer, we haven't really seen an increase or a decline or anything like that. That data has been pretty steady for all those other deer with all intents and purposes as well. But that's the lens that we're coming through. When we're talking about the October lull, we're talking about, oh, why is my shooter not daylighting anymore (laughs) like he was on opening weekend? Well, maybe, like you said, it's because you created several hundred hundred yard or thousand yard grass or, excuse me, ground scent trails. Maybe it's because you left some scent on a tree when you were hanging a camera. Maybe you wind bumped him, something like that. I mean... I was just going to say, every time we've hunted, we've had great hunts, but we've we've bumped deer when we got out. Mm-hmm. And there's almost... And I feel like that goes to the territory of hunting over food. Got, yeah, you know, you know, so like that. Maybe that's a... Maybe we're doing it to ourselves. I'll yeah. point, the, point the barrel at me, right? Like, right. there's... We struggle with that every time. We do have some beautiful whitetail institute clover, and we have some beautiful other plots, and it's like... We hunt it, and then we have a great hunt, but he didn't show up or he mm-hmm. didn't come within range. It's like, you yeah. got to get out of here. Right. <laughs> like with John Henry, when he was in the field, like I waited until it was like black. Pitch black. And yeah. I knew he was there. Like he, I heard deer run away, mm-hmm. but thankfully I took away them being able to see me mm-hmm. clearly, you know, but it, but you still, you know, okay, we just, yep. he, he said something over there wasn't right. Yep. Like made a noise I didn't like. like. Now I'm running. Now I'm running. Like that, you can't prevent that, man. Mm-hmm. It just sucks. And I feel like the, you know, like I said, if you are a, a really excited about hunting season like we are, that there's just a different lens that you can look through. It just totally depends on your goal. We want to kill this buck out here, and neither of us really need meat, and we're not, you know, hard up for that. So that's why we didn't kill those in the early season this year. Maybe as we munch through some venison this uh, this season, maybe I'll kill a doe like in the late season with a gun. Um, but you know, it's kind of like our first deer that we're going to kill this year, I guess that they're going to be with antlers on top of their head, you know? Right. Um, and that's the goal. So that's the goal for us. But I feel like perspective is important. If you're a person that's in a different camp, then, you know, take everything we're saying with a grain of salt, because that's how all our controversies are. That's not the end. That's how everyone are. We're not here to make enemies. We're here to make you think. Um, 
the other misconception, and I feel like this is a good one, kind of getting into some of the deer that we've already seen in October, some of the deer we've killed in October, specifically one that's on my mind, which is the called, we call him the brute buck. It was like um, a deer we filmed, we killed him about 10 years ago, and heaviest deer we've ever, you know, recorded on our scale, about 295 pounds, and that's live weight, that's that's not field dressed, obviously, field dressed be about 255 250 but still when you have a deer that's almost 300 pounds live weight like that's a huge animal right (laughs) uh huge like truck bed filling huge if you got a six foot bed especially so talking about body size i feel like there's a misconception a little bit out there with aging deer in october and i feel like the broader question is when should you age deer because i feel like in the summer deer look really sleek and uh and almost like emaciated like i even see like deer we know to be five like showing their rib cage in the summer Mm -hmm. you know uh when they're walking by our trail cameras or their necks their necks just look so skinny like noodly yeah they look sleek like a two-year-old buck and the other thing is too that's really hard to me um our i guess is it like uncle-in-law kevin right Mm -hmm. is that yeah that'd uh, be correct he he sent me a photo of a deer he hunts down in texas he's like how old do you think this deer is i'm like gosh i'm like the deer that I age normally look way different than the deer that you age, you know, and you yep. have like, and I told him, I said, I can give you a guess, but just, I literally said, I can't really be accurate because mm-hmm. your deer are so much different physiologically yeah. than ours. You live 20 ours. hours away. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, take that into consideration too. Like Mike Lemansky is probably one of the most diversified dude and aging whitetails that I know. He's hunted in North Carolina and Tennessee and Illinois. And I like lived there. Not mm-hmm. just hunted, yep. you know. So he's cataloged all this data, and he's seen the such. He's a watched diverse... all the bean fields in every <laughs> state across, you know, right. like literally twenty states. Where you know? for us, it's like Illinois and Iowa, mm-hmm. the end. Yep. So, you know, I guess what we're what we're trying to talk about is like a deer that looks that you see, especially in our area. We're talking Midwest mm-hmm. in summer looks drastically differently than right now. Mm-hmm. From, and will look drastically different now than he will in December. three weeks from now and two months from now. Yeah. Like, I feel like the deer, a buck, is going to look and be the heaviest from now until about the 2nd of November. Mm-hmm. Because when the 2nd hits or sometime in that area, that's when they start seeking. Yep. And they don't care about food. You know, t- nutrition goes out the window and they're just running crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, so like... Right now, they've had all summer to plump up, all October, early season. They're chomping clover and brassicas and beets and corn. They're mm-hmm. they're just filled out, mm-hmm. you know, and they look really big and pronounced now. And I feel like now is one of the easier times to miss aged deer. Yeah. Same thing with the summer. Like for every, mm-hmm. you know, for the reason that deer during the summer look sleek, they look heavy now. Yep. Mm-hmm. So using John Henry, like, go ahead, talk about that. Yeah, so we have this this deer that um, we're rather unfamiliar with, and we're we've been racking our brain trying to figure out what deer he could have been. Just because on this particular farm, we feel like we have a really good bead on. Like we've mentioned this on the podcast before, the way that we have deer come under our radar, we bracket them. And what we mean by that is we don't assign a hard age to them. We like to see them. We like to get. 10, 20, 100, 500 trail camera pictures. We like to get videos of them during all phases of the year and then make our decision. And sometimes we still land on, yep, this deer is either three or four. And there's some evidence to support that he's three and there's some to support that he's four. Those are our best guesses. And we're not just going to be people that are making crap up. So we feel like that's the most fair and honest way for us to age them. But... That being said, if we have a deer that comes onto our radar as a two, three, four-year-old and we're unfamiliar, it throws us for a loop. So this particular buck, we saw him the other night. He was the one that made that roar we were talking about about five, seven minutes ago. And he came into the plot uh, dusk about five minutes after sunset. So plenty of legal time still left. And he roars. He has this like guttural it was roar. awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> really long, like probably three, four seconds. It just did it rah, once. <laughs> yep. And he was, you know, dinking around with, uh, I believe, like a younger doe or a spike buck that was kind of across the field from us, about 90 yards away from us. So we got to see this deer really well. And so this deer, it's newer to us. Looking at its antlers first, right, when a buck comes out, we can always identify 
who's who typically on this particular farm because there's not a lot of random deer that pop up on us by, you know, their antlers just because we know them so intimately well. We look at this deer and we're like, huh, we don't know that deer because he's a heavier eight pointer. Like if, uh, if you've, you've talked about it before, like you think that your best method of scoring deer and why scoring deer is crap is that it should be a water displacement test because, you know, there's a big difference between a Illinois 170 and a Texas 170 and the way that they look. Right. You know, right. that big, wide, thin look versus that heavy, fat tined, like banana tines kind of look. Mm-hmm. And so the chunk. this deer, this deer's tines, like I feel like your vertical tines, not the beams, but the vertical tines is probably a, one of my biggest indicators of a deer's age of their antlers. Like looking at their antlers, I don't feel like I've ever seen a two-year-old where I'm like, wow, Your vertical tines, not the beams, the vertical tines are like super heavy and thick. And I don't feel like we've seen that a lot on a three-year-old, which leads me to believe that this deer is four plus just by the way his body looks and the way his antlers look and And taking that all into consideration. So we put this on Instagram. You did the other night when you took a picture of him and you got to watch him. Uh, You got to watch him at, you know, literally like three yards. He came out about right behind the blind, (laughs) kind of fed away. You stood no, no. right in your... By the way, jam that motherfucker, dude. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. No jammer. <laughs> I hate that stuff. The uh, <laughs> You drag down wind of me. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> and so this deer walks right behind you and feeds away. And he's, you know, I don't know, the closest shot. You probably could have started shooting him at eight yards and all the way through 30 or 40 yards. Like you had, I don't know, 40, 50 opportunities to kill this deer. And this would have been a, your second time seeing him. And you post this picture. And in through his the front of his body, he looks like extremely chesty, like very filled out. And he is. In through the chest. And, you know, he, to a degree, it look kind of looks like in the picture, if you're you're on Instagram scrolling right now, it almost looks as if he, his front half is a little lower than his back half in the picture, in the photo. And so it gives him the illusion of maybe being even a little bit more amply chested than he is. But he's, his belly, like whether or not he's postured the correct way for the picture to kind of skew what we're talking about. His belly has a pretty big sag to it. It's not like super duper sleek, like a three slash four year old. So our question would be like, is this deer three? Is this deer four? Is this deer five? Like, I don't believe looking at the picture that he's three He looks a little bit bigger to me than a three year old, but that's our topic. And that's our misconception. And, and what we're talking about here as a broader question I feel like late October bucks are maybe the hardest and maybe the worst time to judge the age of a deer that you don't have history with is what we're getting at here. Because in October, they're going to be at their peak weight. And I feel like we talk about this all the time. We used to have a smaller, like a younger deer, we believe. We have no idea. Dagger. Uh, well, no, little fatty poo poo. Oh, Jesus. So we called this deer little fatty poo poo and by far the fattest deer that we've ever seen. That deer was built like Mike Wazowski. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, little skinny legs, huge, like saggy fat roll skin, like, and we're talking maybe a 90 inch buck, a 10 pointer. And but just a scrub shit rack. Just yep. And so, and so he comes onto our cameras here and we're, like I said, we don't have a lot of deer on this particular farm, like sneak up on us. It's not like a big rut funnel. It's just an ambiguous, like block of timber next to other ambiguous blocks of timber. You know, it's not like we have a lot of roamers and chasers through. We pretty much know every deer we see, but this deer comes walking into our camera and he is just fat and he's fat all year. (laughs) He continues the following year to be fat, even fatter in fact. And the biggest deer we've killed, like I said, live weight, 295. This deer had to be 330 plus. Oh, yeah, man. I don't he know just how. looked ridiculous. Because, his, because we have plenty of trail camera video of this deer, and we have plenty of actual video and trail camera video of the deer that's 295. And I don't feel like it's a stretch to say that he's 40 pounds bigger, minimum. This yeah. deer could have been <laughs> heavier than that. And so I feel like one thing that we have to take into consideration when we're aging deer is, number one, there's outliers. Like, there are three-year-old 170s walking around in Illinois right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about, like, the the belief that of your biggest shed that's sitting over there on the rack. Like, the outfitter that year said that he could potentially have been three or four. Yeah. Because his bases, his pedicles are small. Like, they're the size of a quarter, but that is like a 110-inch antler. Yes, I just said 
110 inch antler, like singular and you, antler. And you're right though. If you alone. Like found the shed buck dead. It's, <clears throat> the pedicle is about the size of a quarter. Yeah. It's not big, you know, but then it, but I'll reference Bill Winky again. Bill Winky had, did a crazy plus. cool podcast, and yep. the, some of the biggest deer he's killed, he said they th- thought they were three. Yep. The biggest deer he's ever killed. He's yep. killed a big fucking deer. And he's got, like, data to back that because he's been, and I wish we could jump in a, hot, a time machine and go back, like, 15 years and send all of our teeth into the oh, research I lab. I I'm wish we had that on. I'm going to as well. And uh, I wish we could go back, but, like, I would really be interested, and I just feel like this October myth and misconception, I'd be interested to know like who is the heaviest pound for pound in late October between the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, the five-year-olds and the six-year-olds in Illinois. Mm. My gut wants to say the mm, older deer, maybe it's older deer, but I mean, shoot, there's an awful lot of big fat old three-year-olds that mm-hmm. killed, get killed mm-hmm. in late October mm-hmm. before they start stretching their legs, which brings us to the point and the misconception. I feel like every time you age a deer, you you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Like I mentioned before, in in the summer, Megatron did look noodly. Like he looked like a sleek, like a two or three year old deer to us. Like we could see his ribs. You know, he's not super filled out now. And I don't feel like he's a deer that eats overly right heavy amounts of food anyway. But this particular deer, this random deer, John Henry, that kind of sprung up on us here, I don't know how old he is and we i could based be upon completely the wrong fact, yeah based upon the fact that he's coming into our lap right now like is that just a three-year-old that really really likes to eat or is, or is that a five <laughs> six seven-year-old buck that meandered his way two three four miles because there are research studies that have been shown by deer labs and university of mississippi yep. etc that have shown their shoot there's some white tails that will travel over like close to 40 miles like is that deer from another county <laughs> I don't we know. don't know that i guess it like one way to find out, we just kill him. We kill him and send his <laughs> send teeth in. Teeth in. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't could. know. I, this is the it's thing. It's an that's, interesting experiment. That's but. really like deer are similar to dogs and humans. Like as far as like the genetic physiology, like you went to high school with twenty to three hundred people, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's guys like if you're listening to this, there's guys that are the same exact age as you that look way different than you. Mm-hmm. Same exact age. like Same species, though. I know. Human being. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Say, but they, yeah. Lo- you know, think about, like, I went mm-hmm. to school with guys same as me that are that are five inches shorter and 50 pounds heavier, mm-hmm. you know? And there's guys that I went to school with that are taller than me and weigh the same exact as me. Mm-hmm. You know, like, that's the thing that's really kind of my confliction with body aging i do believe that like to get that sway back and that sag belly does take age but like the sheer size is what we're talking about like Mm -hmm. the 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 weight per se of them is it's kind of really hard like because for the same reason that racks get so much bigger or smaller with age it's Mm -hmm. all genetic like the most accurate we've ever been able to age deer is when they have a characteristic that's non-antler that's a body deformity i guess like with tj he had that really pronounced throat patch Mm -hmm. and white white tube socks on his legs like okay that's easy to tell Mm -hmm. we have a deer that's called hershey's who looks smaller than john henry i wouldn't you agree like in all the photos but he's missing his eye and he has a very very unique rack that's not impressive but like he's had that for four years so Mm -hmm. we know he's at least five probably six you know Mm -hmm. But we know that so well because of his dead eye. Yep. You know, like those types of anomalies in deer are great because it allows you to really identify him a lot easier. Mm-hmm. But when, you know, you've seen those kind of photos flying around where they, they blur out or they like block out the antlers and say, yep. age this deer. It's always interesting to see, you know, and then they pull it off and you're like, whoa, you know, or you just see mm-hmm. the rack age this buck, you yep. know, mm-hmm. it's, it's always interesting because unfortunately that does take a you say it doesn't, but it does. Like if that buck had a 160, 150 inch frame, right? Like mm-hmm. we might have already killed it. Like, yeah. cause we'd be like, I don't know who it is. He sure looks mature. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or if he had, let's say he had a 170 inch rack, mm-hmm. you, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it would, as much as we don't want to say it does, it would probably skew. I think there's our- generalities too, like broad brushstroke things that are pretty accurate. Like, 
I feel like for a two-year-old, even in Illinois or Iowa, if you're not on a deer farm or somewhere where you are injecting and inseminating does and releasing them into the wild on your monster property, I feel like a two-year-old, generally speaking, in Illinois is not going to crack the 150 mark. But I'm not saying that a three-year-old can't. Oh, sure. There are plenty of three-year-old 150s that are going to get blazed up this year, even up to the 170 mark. And that's just regionally based on where we live. So I feel like there's generalities like bases. I've never seen a two-year-old buck with five-plus-inch bases. You know what I mean? No. No. I've no, never not seen... Not even on deer farms. I've never seen... I And I know that we don't feel like we track deer that long, but I, I, I don't believe I've ever seen an eight- or nine-year-old buck... That's a spike. And I feel like you take all of these little things that you kind of mark in your head to use to help you age deer. And the reason that we're tripped up by this deer is because if I had to guess and put a number on it right now, and for those of you guys that have listened to our podcast before, you know how I feel about scoring deer and the numbers. And I do feel like the only reason that I use that nomenclature and that verb is just because, uh, is just because to give you guys a good picture of like this deer. So if you look at this picture on Instagram, you'll see this very barrel chested deer with a little sway in his back. And yet again, I don't know if that's just because he's maybe standing on um, a planting row in the cornfield or not. But his body to me, like off the cuff, he looks to be four, five, or six years old. One of those three ages. I'm not sure which because his belly looks a little bit too saggy for me to say that he's three. However, his antlers are pretty darn heavy, like his physical vertical tines are pretty thick because we've watched him twice now and have quite a few trail camera videos of him, but his antlers are not very big. I'm guessing this deer is probably 120, and so maybe 125, somewhere in that range. Yeah, and not impressive. To, get, to give you guys a good idea, so... Our question would be, you know, and, and eight pointers don't quite get as much antler on their head as ten pointers. They have two less tines. We understand that. However, that's one of those factors where it's like, all right, this deer is random. Just going off his body size alone right now, is he four or is he five? And that's the big hang up with why we're not killing him. Because if we had verification that that deer was five and we weren't going back and forth with this on our head, then I feel like we've already killed him. You know, if there was a little characteristic that let us know that he was five mm -hmm. for sure, then we would have already. I just think the I think a big thing for us to 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 get out is like I don't want people to think we passed him because of his rack. Because yeah. okay, Hershey's is that buck that's on the other farm that he's probably a ninety inch buck. Yeah, and he's a six pointer. He's big six to get the cat out of the bag. Yeah, and like I will shoot him <clears throat> as as soon as I have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, like. So I just, the reason is, is we have so much invested in this farm. It's like, we really want the deer to be able to grow into what they can be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess if we were on Lukoski status, we'd wait until they're six and a half. Right. We're just not that patient. You know, like five and a half is a pretty good bar to set. It's a difficult one to reach. Mm -hmm. And like, I get, I don't know. I'd feel, I'd feel kind of like, man, you definitely messed up if we shot this deer mm -hmm. or me, I should say, if I shot this buck and we sent mm -hmm. him in and they came back as four and a half, I'd be like, what? Uh, you're crap. an idiot he's living on us what mm -hmm. the heck did you do that for you know yep. like yes can he run over to the neighbors and get shot in any of the directions oh, absolutely he can but mm -hmm. like he's made it this far and we've had other deer that make it past this number often yep. like so he know, gets to live i don't know that's where we're at but i i i do a turkey vulture just landed in my yard oh interesting squirrel i don't know what it's gonna eat it's a big son bitch sorry <laughs> it's like a yeah, squirrel the, uh, <laughs> and so i feel like you have to take that into consideration with a big grain of salt when you're aging deer in October because it's the heaviest that their body will be. Like, I will say that, you know, like, there have been deer that we've killed in early, early November that were like, ah, oh, this deer's random, but he looks pretty thick through the body. What if that was just a three-year-old that just loved soybeans and corn? I mean, that's the thing that we think about. What if, um, what if that was a four-year-old like we thought he was? I feel like deer have their own personality, you know, their level of aggression, their level of interacting socially with other deer, their wantingness to eat little fatty poo poo being an outlier. So you have to take many of those things into consideration. So I feel like one of the things that you and I struggle with when we identify a random deer is not misidentifying three and four-year-olds during late October because they are, their body is going to be at max capacity. Right. 
hundred percent. So, well, I don't know. I guess he's either going to live or we're going to kill him. Mm-hmm. I I don't know. Hopefully, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, he lives. We find our sheds. We kill him next year, and then we age him, and we're like, ah, oh, damn, we were off, or yeah, we, we were, were right. off, or we were right. So, in about I don't know, fifty some episodes from now, maybe we'll be able to tell you, yeah, and revisit this and be like, hey, actually. He was this. We were we, we were wrong. We were wrong by two years. He was seven. <laughs> or we were right. Yeah. So, but looking forward again. Next podcast, we will be talking about the hunting sats. That's going to be pretty interesting. It'll probably be a little bit shorter, but um, it's always good to kind of reflect and look at the numbers and the dates and the data. Um, and then on episode one sixty seven, we've got a really cool one coming up. Um, we're actually going to talk about five rut bucks we've killed and what we've learned through harvesting them. So that one's going to land right before, you know, most guys take that vacation. So maybe we can share some stories and some insights on how to kill that. But most importantly, the episodes from last year, the ones that you guys watched at the launch party, plus several other ones are going to go live on October 29th. Mm -hmm. Again, this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday. So set your calendars. We're undecided i think we're gonna probably do a flood launch just give them all to you at once let you let you binge because to be honest i know that i hate waiting, waiting you know <laughs> like it, you, you know i freaking yep that's why i love midwest whitetail so yeah. much i can go sit down and i'm like all right there's like 18 to 32 <laughs> right here in my lap and yeah. i can just go at my own pace it's like yellowstone like i'm so glad i got into yellowstone like in season four because i could just be like we're watching four today yeah for those of you guys that watch game of thrones diligently for oh like the God. nine years it was out whoa you had some patience but anywho we'll catch you on the next one we hope you enjoyed it hope you didn't ruffle your feathers and as always don't waste it